Reinsure has 23 semi-successful partnerships. That should scare every insurer in the room because the yes. reinsurers are moving quicker and they're more innovative. I'm just telling you, I talk to everybody on the ground, the reinsurers are moving quicker and they're more innovative. And if you think about where most insurers sit in the value chain, so you've got agents on this side and there's a lot of channel conflict because they've been managed semi-average by the industry. Then you have the insurer and then you have the reinsurer and if you look at where a lot of the product innovation is actually happening, it's in the reinsurer being pushed to the insurer, being pushed to the agent. So you see brokers now working with reinsurers. You see reinsurers spending a lot of money on infrastructure and you see this big push for everything to become digitized. That actually creates an existential threat for the future of insurance. And if the insurers aren't seeing that, they're not paying attention. We felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the network that is built here. I'm very looking forward to talk to the three gentlemen to talk about how can InsureTech coexist with traditional careers. And after this, I'm very excited to have a beer. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, um, I really hope you can join our conversation. So feel free to ask any questions during the conversation to by the Brella um, mobile app. And before uh, we start to talk, I'd like to understand where you are coming from, your background. So could you raise your hand if you are from an insurance company? Cool, thank you. Anybody from startups? Thank you. Anybody from invest, uh, anybody are investors? Zero. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and before that, now um, we want to have a self-introduction from these three gentlemen. Let's start from Cole. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, my name is Cole Sercek. Uh, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called DocDoc. Uh, DocDoc Doc is uh, the world's first uh, patient intelligence company, and basically what we do is, is we match uh, patients uh, based on their unique needs with doctors based on their unique expertise. Um, yeah. Before that, I spent a lifetime uh, as a technology venture capitalist and in private equity. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Mark Dennis. I run digital partners in, in Europe. Um, great to be here. I know this is the last session. I did hear what you said about beer, by the way, so um, you, you kind of lost me a little bit in that direction. Um, our business is a partnership business, so we, we partner up with InsureTech's other interesting disruptors um, to build insurance businesses. Talk more about it later, but we've got around 20 partnerships active. We've been going for coming on four years now, so we're kind of, I don't know, almost veterans, I guess, of the InsureTech space, you could say. And I'm Thibault, I work for uh, AXA Partners. Uh, AXA Partners is a uh, unit of AXA dedicated to servicing. I look after servicing health insurance customers. That means reimbursing health claims. So we really are um, at the center of the chain. Um, what uh, we're hoping to get from conferences uh, like this one is really to get partnerships to come in and help us do what we do better for the end customers in terms of being faster, being better, being more accurate, being more innovative, being more customer friendly. We've decided that it's better to partner as opposed to building every asset internally. So we've tried um, a lot, quite a few partnerships in the past three years. Some succeeded, some have yet to succeed, and this is why I'm happy to be here today. Great, thank you, thank you everyone. Um, so I think that the topic is a little bit interesting, like can insurtechs coexist with uh, traditional insurers? I sort of feel that uh, is under the condition we are assuming they can't coexist. So I heard uh, Thibault, you are working with uh, Coo, so you are like, uh, exactly the example of uh, traditional insurers and working with insurtechs. Do you guys get along? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I will answer first. Uh, yes, we do get along. Um, we've, uh, that's actually a very good experience uh, personally because um, in my current role, the, almost one of the first conversations I've had with a, uh, a fintech, a health tech, was with uh, DocDoc. Doc. So, and I think at that time for DocDoc, Doc, he was also the, probably the beginning of a, of a new journey. So we've learned a lot together. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we've had conversations with other companies and uh, I think that what worked, the companies with which uh, pa these partnerships have worked, usually were companies who had a clear understanding of the time it takes to collaborate with uh, an, a large insurance company, as well as the money it requires to stay for years before that partnership actually sees the light. And the last thing that I learned from uh, working together as well is the incredible importance for a, a health tech to understand the importance of the stakeholder mapping. Insurance companies are remarkably complicated organizations. I think there are a few, a few insurers here. So trying to get an understanding of what it is and how long it's going to take to get everyone to vouch for you is quite important. Thank you, Thibault. That's very nice of you for saying that. Uh, so, Cole, could you be honest with me? Like, what, uh, how do you feel working with traditional insurers? Uh, what were the challenges? So I think in my last life, I was Hitler yeah. <laughs> or Hemmler or somewhere along the lines, I did something very bad to, in this life, be responsible for working with insurance. <laughs> That's what I honestly think. But... Um, Ouch. Uh, yeah. Here's the thing, right? Um, it's easy to point to a big organization and say, oh, you guys, you are blah, 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 and you should be something else. That's a uniquely naive perspective. The reality is, is these insurance companies are big and complex and largely very refined for what they're doing today. And the challenge is, is to help them move the move into an environment that's changed. Uh, I like to think about the insurance world. A uh, hundred years ago, when insurance really started going mainstream, uh, it was an incredibly innovative product. I mean, it was one of the most innovative. The entrepreneurs that sat in a room and did the math and realized that they could bring a group of people together, get them all to pay something. They could take a big chunk of it for themselves, distribute what was back what was left to a, a, a group and everyone would be better off. I mean, that's an incredible product. And, and so I actually look at the roots of insurance as being terribly innovative. In fact, they were so innovative that the industry itself didn't really have to change much over a hundred years. Like it really fundamentally hasn't changed much. You know, if you look at the IT systems and you look at, I can't tell you which actuary that I was speaking to, but I was speaking to the global head of an actuary in a major city in Europe recently. And he said, there's two floors of people beneath me in this building. All they do is run numbers. And they come to me at the end of the year and they say, here's our model and our forecast for the next year. And you know, we then get into the board meeting and we, we sit down and we say, okay, how much did we spend last year? Okay, increase that by 7% in premiums. And they, 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 don't, they don't even look at all of the math and all of the forecasts that were done. And it's been done that way in insurance for a very long time. And so I think what's going to happen here is we're going to have to develop IT systems and data models that are uh, vastly more sophisticated and can allocate risk in a far more dynamic way and can understand their consumer in a way that allows for a lot more value to be delivered. The future of insurance is about solving the problem that you bought the policy for. It's not just the risk. And, and that's, I think we all agree, getting these organizations that aren't designed to do that, to do that, is going to take a long time. And it's going to be the persistent to get through. Can I add something? I'm going to jump in. Sure. So uh, first off, I, th I think you were generous saying 100 years, it's probably 400, um, which is what I normally reference, which is being cruel probably to the industry that, that feeds my children. But there you go. Um, I like what you said because I, I would liken this to game theory, if you like, and this isn't a zero-sum game, right? So we're in Hong Kong, so everybody knows game theory probably. Um, 
everybody can benefit from this, you know, ultimately the customer, but you know, I come from a reinsurer technically. Um, we expect to benefit from these transactions. We expect our insure tech partners to benefit, customer, everybody in the middle. So actually this kind of evolving ecosystem, there you go, I've said it now, um, a bit overused I think, probably heard it a hundred times today already. Um, but everybody that, that plays can actually gain something. And so I, the change I've noticed, I'm probably jumping a bit too far ahead, but in the last three or four years is that when we first started our business, there was a lot of kind of cynicism from insurers in particular about insure techs, probably better described as, as fear and loathing maybe, perhaps not in that order either. Um, but now there's a lot more of a collaborative feel, certainly where, where I operate, which is mostly Europe and the US, less so in Asia at the moment, and it feels slightly behind the curve here, but it's certainly you know, on a collaborative footing now, I guess you see the same. Cool, uh, Mark, so I have a, uh, I heard you started it four years ago. That's pretty early considering uh, a big insurer as you. So may I ask like, what has Munich Re Digital Partners uh, achieved through the four years and what were, what were the challenges? Well, we've grown, I mean, essentially we're a startup that's, that lives under a corporate umbrella. So we were formed deliberately to be disruptive. So, you know, part of that disruption is internal actually. So we can be quite, irritating probably to certain parts of the group. Um, I mentioned at the top we're a partnership model, so we have around, I think it's 23 live partnerships, which, which means 23 businesses selling insurance business, right? Employing people, and then the services that go with that. So that, you know, when I talk about the ecosystem, genuinely mean that, that this is a um, real business, not an experiment. Uh, we've grown from two people, so me and another guy with the, the founders, and we spun out of the, the parent company. We're now nearly 100 people. So, you know, it takes some scale actually to run or to support 23 businesses. And we continue to add new, new stuff into the portfolio at the top and some drop out at the bottom. And of course, we, the, the goal is to scale up those businesses. Um, we invest as well. So it's a, a kind of a sister company to, to the business I run. Um, we invest in roughly a third of the ones that we partner with, but that's a, it's not a precise metric, but just that's just for information. So massive growth, massive kind of trajectory, if you like, and we probably surprised ourselves as much as anybody about how much, how, how far we've gone in that time. I'm actually only 25 years old, but uh, the four <laughs> years, <laughs> the four, yeah, I know, it's hard to believe, I, yeah. I, of course, I mean 27, really, but yeah, four years has nearly killed me, I think. So now I do kind of get what it's like to work in a startup, right, because it's really, really hard. And I get paid a salary, by the way, so it's not as hard as it can be for the guys that mortgage their house and sell one of their children to fund their business. So I made the last bit up. Thank you. Um, so, Thibaut, could you tell me more about what uh, AXA Partners is uh, doing with InsureTech and what's your goal? Yeah, sure. So, the space I'm in specializes in uh, else claim management. So, we're, uh, we're a TPA, call it that way. So, uh, our customers are insurance companies and, and they usually ask us three things. Uh, the first thing is uh, they ask us to do whatever we can to contain medical costs, right? And I think that's a common challenge in the health insurance industry. The second thing is to make claiming easier. Uh, as someone said in the conference yesterday, uh, claims get you the bad rating in insurance, right? So anything we can do to make claiming easier. And the third thing we're usually being asked to work on is the uh, data transparency and accuracy. Um, so, in each of these three spaces, we've uh, partnered with some different companies. When it comes to uh, medical cost containment, which is usually the first pain point of insurance companies when they come to us, uh, we've um, had some successful partnerships with uh, disease-specific startups, like startups who would focus on uh, containing medical cost on people who have dengue fever, right? In, uh, in Malaysia, for instance, among our book of almost 2 million injured people, the cost of dengue fever accounts for close to 7%. So the moment we partner with a startup of health tech that can help us tackle that issue, we have a straight impact. When it comes to make claiming easier, we keep testing uh, things. 
the space of digitalizing the claim process is now, I think, pretty, pretty well advanced in all insurance companies, I think. So, so that is fine. But interestingly enough, when you go on the ground, when I go on the ground in Thailand or in Malaysia, we have a remarkable uh, volume of uh, claims that we receive by fax. By fax, really. So we might have the best customer front end. 60% of my customers' customers use faxes. So my challenge in that space is, does anybody have an OCR that can actually get it right? You know, really, from a fax? Um, and the third thing is the data transparency uh, and accuracy. And on that particular front, uh, AXA has, done, has invested an enormous amount of money in central, especially on that, 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 that issue. So we're doing it internally. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, it's very impressive what you two companies are doing. Uh, I'd like to change a little bit gear to the startup side. Um, so just to go back to coexist co -exist with insurers, like uh, from the first place, were you trying to interrupt the uh, insur insurance industry or were you meant to work with insurers? Watch out. Watch out. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so I have a, I, I, speaking of disrupt, uh, let's have a little more, uh, let's make this a little more confrontational, be more fun. So the reinsurer has 23 semi-successful partnerships. That should scare every insurer in the room because the yes. reinsurers are moving quicker and they're more innovative. I'm just telling you, I talk to everybody on the ground, the reinsurers are moving quicker and they're more innovative. And if you think about where most insurers sit in the value chain, so you've got agents on this side, and there's a lot of channel conflict because they've been managed semi-average by the industry. Then you have the insurer, and then you have the reinsurer, and if you look at where a lot of the product innovation is actually happening, it's in the reinsurer being pushed to the insurer, being pushed to the agent. So you see brokers now working with reinsurers. You see reinsurers spending a lot of money on infrastructure, and you see this big push for everything to become digitized. That actually creates an existential threat for the future of insurance. And if the insurers aren't seeing that, they're not paying attention. I've been studying technology disruption since I, well, uh, let's say I'm 44. I went to MIT at 26. So for that much distance, and even before that, I've been studying technology disruption. General insurers are going to be disrupted, not by startups, but by reinsurers and brokers that's where it's coming from. Just, so I, I just call that out. If you want to see the, the, the big elephant in the room is going to be channel conflict, reinsurers, and uh, independent agency networks becoming independent agent networks, and starting to partner with reinsurers to then distribute their own policies. Brokers starting to partner with reinsurers to sell policies direct. The Tokopedias and the Gojacks of the world partnering with reinsurers to just sell policies direct. So the competitive intensity in the space is going to increase massively without startups. Startups are the enablers that can help create data-centric services that can create differentiated product offerings. And so there's a window for insurers to actually recognize this and take, it, take control of their customers um, and actually do something with that from a product offering point of view. Um, we do something we take a small sliver of that in health. Uh, but that's not exactly the question you asked, so I don't want to ramble too much. To your question specifically, um, the trick to dealing with insurance is you have to go top down and bottom up. It's way harder than I ever expected when we started this business. Um, you have to go all the way to the global CEO in Munich or Paris or Switzerland, or just take your pick, or London, and you, get, you need the C-suite to say, hey, this is really interesting. Then they'll push it to regional, and regional says this is interesting. And at the same time, you need to be going to the base layer and the, organ, the, the director of so-and-so in Hong Kong and getting them to buy off. And then the next layer above has to buy off. And then you kind of have to go like this. Because and it's, just, it's just really hard to get things done. Um, that's one thing. The second thing that I would encourage, there aren't that many startups in the room, but um, who the startup picks as a partner is the single most important thing about determining that startup's success. 
because a big insurer can kill a startup. They can promise the world and then they can renegotiate midstream and they can suck up all that startup's time and they can kill an otherwise really successful business. And they can do it quite easily. So startup partnership selection and the personalities that you're dealing with and the buy-in of the champions that you have and the breadth, that's everything. Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, just go back a little bit. I think you mentioned a uh, better IT system is one of the factors uh, that can uh, enable better coexist uh, between uh, startups and uh, um, insurers. Could you expand that a little bit? Like, because I think most of the insurance companies are um, paying, like, uh, are suffering from the legacy systems. So, okay. Um, so, Thibaut, you mentioned this idea that the front end claims, a lot of it's quite digitized at this point. Uh, here's what I would say most of the digital systems and insurers look like. What they've done is, is they've taken an analog process and they've put it into, you know, www. So www.analogprocess.com. That describes most of the insurer's front end systems. A digital system is a system that uh, doesn't have open text fields that allow you to write whatever you want in them. It's a system that everything that comes in is ingested in a machine-readable format so that there can be an, a, an integrated knowledge ontology beneath it so that you can actually start learning and improving a system. Think about Amazon. When you go to buy something on Amazon, how much customization is there? That's a digital system. Think about Google, right? You put in a word, but Google turns those words into concepts and then uses, uses uh, bots to search the internet and bring you back relevant that's not what's happening in insurance right now. We've taken digital processes, we've went to the lowest cost contractor, and we've built out the analog approach in a digital, in a digital way. That won't buy very much. And so this is why 2021 is, and 2020 is gonna be a pretty interesting time for insurance tech, because the insurers are changing their DNA. And they're bringing in more people that understand what a digital process means and what data, data science, not actuarial science. They're giant, they're completely different fields. And so they're starting to recognize, hey, uh, there's a lot more to this than simply having a website that can collect faxed forms. Uh, and that's where the real benefit from digitization comes from. And that's where they'll begin to, do, to separate, you know, the average startup from the ones that are actually going to make it. Thank you. Uh, any points you want to add for the topic of in, uh, interruption and enabler or IT system? No, I agree with Cole in a sense that um, uh, we in, indeed. I mean, I I agree that about the analog thing. We've digitalized processes. Most of us, we've all been guilty of this. I think. Now, when it comes to jumping into the space you described. Uh, better than I could ever describe, is uh, not something that I believe insurers will do internally. So that, again, will come through partnerships. Um, I, in, my, in the small space I'm in, I know I don't have the resources to come out with anything that is even remotely close to what you're describing. So back to the, to the topic, it's not even coexistence. It's pure collaboration I need on this front, admittedly. Oh, so much to say. So you raised about 15 interesting points. First off, I thought you were 25 as well, by the way, <laughs> not 44. Um, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's too much, isn't it? Um, so the, one of the reasons that the reinsurers, uh, I wouldn't like to say are winning, but why we're winning is that we don't have the legacy. So my, my unit was created from scratch. We have no legacy in terms of technology. More importantly, we have no legacy in terms of thinking, right? So we, we're aligned with startups. We, one of our USPs is speed to market. So we know if we don't get a launch within, well, we say four to six months, I prefer to do it quicker, actually, you know, our startup partner's going to run out of runway. So we are very much geared towards, in fact, I describe it as gearing, we're very much geared towards making the machine work better so the slow moving parts on the, the regulated bit at the back, which we're responsible for, we call it doing the heavy lifting. Our job in the middle is to gear that so it moves at the right kind of um, velocity with, with our startup partners so we don't delay them and then they get killed basically because they run out of cash. Um, 
interesting about the the state of reinsurance kind of moving into the space as well. You naturally, you know, my parent company that can become frictional because you know we're a reinsurer for all of you in the room probably. Um, I guess we reinsure every single insurance company in the world, so we have a relationship with everybody. And then you have this disruptive unit bringing in startups to deliberately disrupt that core business, essentially. Um, so I have a lot of discussions internally about what are you guys doing on my patch. You know, this is kind of internally frictional, which I quite like, by the way, but it um, means we're doing something interesting. So I, I think the... the the advantage, the competitive advantage we have is that we can start almost from scratch. I mean, my unit was created from scratch. Other insurers and reinsurers take a different approach where you're trying to utilize assets that they've already got, which maybe is a different approach, maybe it's better or worse, who, who knows, time will tell. But I, I quite like the way we've approached it. Thank I you. I didn't answer any question there, by the way. <laughs> I, I just talked. <laughs> I so, think we all enjoy that. So I don't actually think the insur the reinsurers are planning to take over the insurance space. They just, in they just inevitably will. Like that's it's not they're not setting out to do it. They're just partnering with in insure techs faster, and they're building better systems and better mousetraps. And then you're just going to see them enable grab. Go I'm so jab. happy to hear you are going to coexist. <laughs> well, no, but understand grab go jack. C in Southeast Asia, right? Then they come in here and they, all of a sudden they do the, their first direct, the only takes one, their first direct deal with Hutchison Wampua or a couple of the self-insureds. And what you end up seeing is, remember, the marginal cost of a business, the, aver or the, the average cost of a product is determined by the marginal cost of the, low co of the competitor. So insurance is inherently a commodity at this point. If you look at health and you look at all the different products in the health space, there's small, medium, and large. That's the level of personalization. If you look at auto, it's kind of the same way. These are inherent commodities. And so it's going to be the efficient player that sets the price in the industry. I mean, I can give you a couple of examples without names, but we already work with directly with distribution, right? So yeah. auto manufacturers, BMW, I can give you the name. Um, oh no, I've said it. Um, so, but that's public, and that's that's through an InsureTech partnership. So, the InsureTech brought, believe it or not, BMW headquartered in Munich. You know, Munich Re headquartered in Munich. No surprise. The chairman play golf together or whatever, um, and the InsureTech brings the uh, brings BMW to the, he the our headquarters in Munich for a meeting, which is a bit odd, isn't it, that we have to do that? But that's uh, you know how that relationship worked. But we have direct relationships with retailers, other auto manufacturers now. So exactly what you've, you've just referenced, that you know, this is how we operate. Yeah, thanks. I totally agree. Like open innovation definitely will be the key factor of uh, InsurTech or the future of the insurance industry. Uh, so I'd like to ask a question for Thibault. I heard you are not only working with startups and also you are like a doing mentor for the, some of them. Uh, actually, I want to know, how does that work and uh, um, actually what did you learn from like mentoring them from the startups and the process? Well, um, I don't think I brought anything to them really. I probably learned more than I brought to them. Uh, what I could share with them is the complexity of our organizations and, uh, and the fact that for a lot of health techs, the first interaction with uh, existing large insurance company will always be very positive um, every time honestly if you go to the chief health officer of any of our entities you're gonna get a round of applause and let's work together let's conquer the world and by let's conquer the world they mean 2032 at best so uh, <laughs> So um, th I think my contribution to that was to say, well, you know, watch out. You know, of course they want to work with you. There are many reasons, and I'll get to this. But the reality is that it takes time. You've got competitors. The minute you will uh, get out of this room, someone else will come in with uh, probably more intel than you have because that person has seen your presentations through whatever way. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to bring to them. Just trying to avoid that they fall in traps, really. 
Um, so that's me. Now, from a AXA perspective, this large group, like a lot of insurers, you know, um, I don't know if I have the power to say this, but we, don't, we know we're going to be disrupted, but we don't know from what angle. So a lot of us, Allianz, Pru, AIA, Manulife, and all of us, we're testing different angles to reduce the risk. One of them would be to invest in startups. Another one could be to coach some startups to make sure that they're close to you. Another one could be to do some, an, an enormous amount of pilots everywhere to make sure that you got you know, an existing relationship. Um, so that's one way to reduce the risk um, in the absence of any better strategy. Thank you. Do, do you want to ask something? Uh, so there's not a lot of startups in the room, so I'm not going to break anyone's heart. Uh, 99% of the startups you've made here aren't going to be around in the next year and a half. Uh, and they're not going to be around because there's a giant maturity mismatch. There's, there's a maturity mismatch and there's an expertise mismatch. So the maturity mismatch is startups that are needing to raise money on a quarterly basis or a six month basis or a year long basis. And uh, a, ins a federated insurance system that is that moves glacier on, on a glacierly pace. Um, those two things make it really hard for a really innovative company to, to, to succeed. Like it's it's just the reality of it. So uh, this idea that insurers are going to partner with a whole bunch of startups, the r it's the wrong approach. The 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 more prudent approach for all of the insurers out there. Pick, find startups that have been around for a while, that have founders that have the capacity to consistently raise money, and invest in the partnership. Because when you're partnering big company to small company, it's a lot less about, I mean, the technology is really important, but what you're biting into is the execution capabilities of a smaller innovative team. And so what's going to end up happening in the insure tech space is it's going to end up being a winner take all. It's going to be like e-commerce. You know, there aren't a thousand, you know, there's Amazon, right? And, in, and there's Alibaba. There's going to be a few really meaningful insurance tech platforms that gain scale and they, and they overcome this inherent complexity and inertia in the insurer space and they, and they get to scale. Um, you know, what percent of your 23 partnerships do you think will globally scale with Munich Re? 100%. <laughs> I have to, because uh, it's a bit like, yeah, it's a bit like children, all, isn't all it? All of your kids it's are bit like children. You're not allowed to have favourites, but you have secretly got favourites, but you just can't let the other ones know, can you? So, um, I mean, we foster all of them, and of course, you're exactly right, by the way, there'll be, of the 23, there'll probably be five big winners, if you like, and there'll be some that drop off the bottom, and there'll be quite a lot in the middle that fail to scale. If there's five out of 23, scale. that's awesome. Well, we've already done the filtering, though, so... So in terms of, just to give you an idea of numbers, I mean, we, we've got scouts in the US and um, in Europe, and we've got someone in Singapore, and we've got someone in Australia. So we've got people dotted around meeting startups. But we've met more than a 1,000 insure-tech startups, as they would label themselves. They're not all pure insure-tech, really, but more than a 1,000. And I, to, your, to your point, Carl, I, I guess 800 of those are no longer around, right? Well, five out of a 1,000 is less than a percent, so... I buy that. I think that's about right. And, and so um, you're not doing yourself a favor by setting up a pilot that puts all the risk on the startup. It's like, ha ha, I just did a deal that's going to fail for sure. Why waste your time as a big company? You're vastly better off to invest in fewer partnerships and actually put some money in there to make it a win-win so that you can build your ecosystem. If nothing else, you'll learn. But if you, I mean, the thing that amazed me about Asia, Doc Doc would never have been around if I'd have started this out of undergrad. I mean, I had seven years working for one of the largest private wealth firms in the world that allowed me on my name to raise $25 million. If I didn't have that, we wouldn't be here. And there's just no way. It was not because of the success of the insurance partnerships. Most of those insurance partnerships thus far have been, why don't you do a lot of work for free uh, and if you ac accomplish the impossible, then we'll sit and talk about maybe doing something in a few years. Like, if we weren't on a mission, we wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be in this room right now. Hey, we're here to change the world of healthcare because the patients need it. Like, that's really why we're here. And we will be successful because of that mission. And it'll be despite the insurers, not because of them.
And I, I mean, I, I don't mean to be conflicting, but it's just, it's the reality of what we see every day. And it will be a winner take all. There'll be a few platforms that do really well and everyone else will starve. Yeah, thank you. I think um, that's something we really need to think about. Like now a lot of like pilots, POCs are happening, but uh, what, what does that go after that? Uh, it's really something serious because like if it takes three months, actually that's very vital for an uh, insure tech startup. Um, so I'd like to ask if you two of you have any uh, thoughts to add on that point. Like when you run a POC, uh, are you like how, how serious you are? How serious I am. <laughs> My wife asks me that every day. <laughs> um, so um, I think um, it would be great for um, a large insurance company to uh, partner with two to three tech companies and, and roll them out globally, right? Uh, and it sounds about the right thing to do. I have no objection against that. <clears throat> but factually, I think it's a very difficult exercise for large carriers because that would mean to have a fair and a very good, actually not fair, a granular understanding of the pain points of all the countries you're in. And to be certain that the company you're partnering with will answer most of the needs of all of these countries. And then it implies that that company has a rock solid system, as we say, that is fully scalable in all of these countries. Um, but it sounds like the good thing to do. We heard from, from Babylon and their partnership with Pru. I think it's around somehow the same lines. Yeah. Uh, so I guess my, 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 my feeling is that it sounds good, but it's been proven to be very difficult so far. But it sounds like the right thing to do. Thank you. Um. I mean, I, I, I'm not so keen on... So, so Munich Re does loads and loads of stuff in the innovation space. So at any one time we've got maybe 150 projects underway, right? So really it's kind of the engine room of innovation, um, certainly from a reinsurer perspective. So there's a load of stuff in there that you would call proof of concept experiments and so on. In fact, my business used to be described as a strategic experiment. In fact, I, did, I described it as that. Then I got told off by our board member who said, no, it's not, it's a real business. And then he asked me about PL or something and I ignored that last bit. But um, yeah, I know it was awkward. That's so why I'm here now, apparently I got fired. But, um, but so I don't really like the whole proof of concept pilot thing. I mean, really what I want to do is, maybe to Cole's point earlier, is to, to be really good at partner selection and back the ones that we think are, are gonna win in some capacity and yeah, launch with a, a particular uh, MVP. I don't like that either that much, by the way. Um, but launch with something that's real and then expand on it. And another thing I don't like is fail fast either. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit grumpy, I think I'm jet lagged. But fa I, I prefer fail smart because it's like, you know, f f fail whatever, pivot, learn something, move around a bit. So, but build a real business. And, and if you're continually experimenting with no real kind of end product, then eventually you, you will be one of the ones that fails potentially because you're going to run out of time and money. Thank you. Um, I think we can expand this topic like forever, but I'd like to take some questions from our audiences. We have another 10 minutes left. So first, how would how should the insure tax act would ensure us to achieve the best result? I'd like to have the answer from both you and also the uh, gentlemen from insurance companies. Sure. So from from my perspective, uh, the first thing you have to do is build a broad base of supporters in the organization, really broad. So you need regional support. You need regional CEO support then you need local CEO support, then you need local director level support, and ideally you have global support so that people are watching it, and that allows, with enough eyeballs, you to get some people in that organization to have KPIs around the success of the partnership. And, and I think that's an important part. They, it can't just be, well, let's experiment and see, because no one will pay attention to it in the insurance company. So there's somebody in that company has to have a KPI that is that partnership, um, because these are hard. Uh, so that's, that's the first piece of it. The, the second piece of it is you need to get a framework in place with the insurer that allows regular meetings at, regular, at a regular time with regular stakeholders, so that we're measuring things very clearly and we're understanding, well, this broke and why did it break and how do we adjust? And you gotta get into a cadence, it's like riding a horse 
you have to get into a cadence with the with the, the partnership so that you guys are collaborating because all these partnerships are about innovation and about learning. And that's really what you're buying when you work with a startup. You're buying a group that can actually innovate with you. Thank you. Um, and Thibault, what do you think InsurTechs can do to make their life easier working with insurance companies? So, um, <coughs> Adding on, writing on what you said, cool, I think two more things. First, uh, understand the timeline. We get it, it takes forever. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's an understatement. Um, I feel the, like the, the I'm the, thing, the marriage thing. guidance in between you two. I, can't, I don't like it. <laughs> that's because you're too old. Maybe, no? Um, no, the second thing, I think, just to, to write on, back, on the back of what you said, I think uh, it's in Asia, in the insurance industry, and by extension to quite a few other industries, it's important to know that there is a 20 to 30% staff turnover every year, right? So once you've done all the mapping, which Cole was, 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 was uh, mentioning, understand that in a year time, one out of the three persons you've talked to will be gone, okay? So that, is, that doesn't sound very positive, but you need to know that. So that CEO here, who's a big fan, who's uh, done selfies with you, hashtag on LinkedIn, and is, you know, is your savior, well, guess what? He's, he's moved to South America, and now he's doing PNC. So um, yeah, I think you need to factor it in. <laughs> Don't know what to say. A um, couple, couple of things. So uh, one is to be kind of, as open and transparent as you can be. We always have lots of conversations about who owns the customer and who owns the data and, and actually the value is in sharing it and, do, and you know treating the asset as something that you can use together. So that's one thing. And the second one is probably don't get really hung up on alignment of interest because there's no such thing as perfect alignment. Um, focus rather on managing each other's expectations. So know what everybody wants from the the relationship at various points in time, and of course it changes over time, but just be kind of, it actually is a bit like a relationship with you, with you two. Just make sure that everybody's getting something out of it, and if you disagree, you know, agree who gets the cat, that's what I would suggest. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's move to the next question. So, um, that's for Thibault. Uh, you mentioned that data transparency is a priority for you. What kind of data is most valuable for insurers to have? Um, I, I'm not a data scientist here, so I'm going to try to speak from a real business perspective. Um, what insurance companies are asking us to provide is information that allows them to perform fraud, waste, and abuse check thoroughly. So that's the first thing. Uh, second thing is they would uh, leverage the data to come out with the right uh, pricing, notably for group health insurance. For instance, the more insight they have, the, the sharper, the sharper their, their pricing can be. And I guess the third reason would probably be designing the right products. Uh, if you have the good information on your customers, how they behave, where they go, the type of illnesses they have, how these diseases evolve, uh, then you can probably build better products. That would be the three, I think, top reasons, top of my head. Thank you. And uh, uh, do you have like uh, any additional opinions? I, I think yeah. I said it before, probably by inadvertently answering the, the next question. But I think being open and sharing as much data as, as is appropriate or feasible or legal, and understanding the value between you is definitely the right approach, rather than you know being protective of, of what you think is an asset that because probably using it on your own is not that valuable. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question, um, what has been the best cooperation that you have ever seen between a traditional career and an insured hack? I feel you two are already doing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, if there is any other, other cases you can share, um, Mark. <laughs> I like all my children. So, I mean, I, we, we've got a lot of success stories. I shouldn't really... Pick, pick one out, but I, I guess I will. <laughs> so, Bought by Many is a is the very first partnership that we struck about nearly four years ago now. Um, they sell pet insurance in the UK, and, and we they were actually the catalyst for our entire business after that. So off the back of meetings with them, they were looking for a, an insurer, actually, who could 
build the products that they wanted and launch them in the timelines that they wanted. Seven products launching at the same time, some of which had never been sold in the UK before. So things like pre-existing conditions for pets uh, and cover for older pets, which is typically, you know, once a dog reaches about, about eight years old, you typically can't get cover because you know, they get sick and then you throw them in the river. So, um, uh, so that partnership's been fantastic for us, you know, not least because it was the catalyst for everything else, but it's just, it's a long-term relationship. So we build out this business. It's still the biggest part of our European portfolio. And I never really thought I'd end up being a pet insurer, but there you go. I haven't even got a pet. Uh, I have a turtle. Oh, they do. They, they insure exotic pets as well. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Great. Uh, do you have any like use cases you want to share? Uh, I mean, um, yes, uh, for sure. We we had, we've had a, our few share of successes in some aspects, but I always question what is a good partnership as well. I don't want to open here an enormous box, but if it's uh, increasing top line, then we have distribution uh, partnership with some uh, insure tech in in some parts of the world. If it's about increasing um, uh, stickiness of the customers, we have other partnerships that got on. But in, in these past two days, uh, we, we've seen, I think, some what I consider to be good players as well, like the, uh, the, the Babylon Health partnership is, is quite, it's quite big. The MyDoc partnership is also quite big. The, uh, uh, the Medix partnership is also quite, quite enormous. I mean, it's, uh, these are, I think, tangible from what I see and from what I heard, you know, very large successes. Thank you. Um, then I have last question for you. Um, you mentioned if you want to work well with the insurance company, you have to reach out all those layers. Uh, which layer do you think is the most challenging one? I, I, I think they're all, they're all the same. I mean, so getting, getting into the very, like, and, and so those partnerships you were mentioning earlier, I have some insight into a lot of those. I don't think any of those are company make. The Babylon Health is a is a is a company maker for Babylon. The other ones, I I don't think so. Like I just, I mean, there's a lot of PR, but you know, I I don't believe. Um, yeah, uh, how do I say this? The insurance companies that start thinking system systemically about these problems are going to be the ones that build competitive advantage. And and in a digital world. A digital product is one where with every interaction with it, the system takes the data, uses the data to improve the system. So every time Google's crawl bots uh, go, go over a web page, they get a better insight of that page and it is used to improve search. So search itself gets better every year. It, insurance, the, the, the insurers that win in this market with every claim will be able to create better customer service and reduce claim costs. It won't be an or, it's an and. So every time data comes into the system, it improves the overall system. Right now, the claim comes in, it's paid, the data is thrown in the river, and there's no improvement in the system. And that's just the way, that's an analog process. That's not a digital process. Every time you make a claim, every time you go to Amazon and you buy an item, the logistics of Amazon improve ever so slightly. The efficiency from group buying improves, so the price goes down. Everything about Amazon improves every time with every claim, or with every purchase. And, and so that's gonna be the thing that really defines insurance tech going forward. And, and so you can't do that with one person. You just can't. So a one-off partnership that generates a lot of marketing buzz mm. might allow a company to raise a round, but it's not going to generate fi a, a, lot of, a lot of free cash flow for that company. Thank you. I totally agree with that. Um, so I have one or two minutes left. So um, I'd like to finish to ask a last question to Mark to bring the, uh, this panel from Asia to you more globally. So I think this has been a very nice uh, conference, the two days conference. So what's your impression, Mark? Because I know you come from all the way from London and probably you have seen like what's happening now in Asia. What's your impression like uh, comparing to Europe? 
I guess there's two. I had two takeaways. One, one this morning, I kind of knew the Ping An numbers before a bit, but then I looked at them on the screen, and I'm like, okay, that's 100 billion of revenue. And I looked at Munich Re numbers, and we're quite a big organization, 140 years old or something, and our, our annual revenue is 50 billion. And I'm thinking, crikey, that's double what we write globally in one country, which is pretty impressive and slash scary. Um, the other takeaway for me was that some of the conversations I've heard, some of the stuff I've heard on stage, sounds a bit like the conversations we were having maybe three years ago, and I don't mean to be disrespectful in any, in any sense, it's just I, I think the market in insurtech here is slightly behind certainly the US, but, but Europe, and when I say Europe, I mean, I mean mainly UK, France and Germany probably. So, you know, as I said, we've met more than a thousand startups and I've heard lots of the stories many times over actually and I'm sort of hearing some of the same ones again while I'm here. So it just feels like slightly behind the curve, which is not really a bad thing necessarily because if you accept that you're four years behind but you're moving twice as fast, it doesn't take that long to catch up. So that would be my takeaway without any disrespect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone here like from insurance companies, startups, we will work together to push the insure tech move forward. And next time Mark come here, he will be impressed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, thanks for your time and your insightful uh, information and also your sense of humor. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for your attention and time. <laughs>